one of the things that I actually wanted to do is, so I presented in the last Berkeley conference a paper on urban welfare regimes and social protection. So one of my problems was uh, what to do this year, because so many of you are around the table again. <laughs> so, so what I, you've forgotten, good. So one of the things that I um, actually took the opportunity to do is to sort of almost keep some of the bigger welfare questions on the bigger meta questions on hold and actually do something very similar to China and look very procedurally at a very particular point about implementation. And so I'm going to take a certain set of context for granted. I'm going to take Partho's provocation from the last panel that we are moving towards universalization. So therefore, a certain spatiality should matter less. And I'm actually going to say that in the procedural aspect, that doesn't happen. Universalization does not take away um, the importance of spatial location. And the two critical questions for urban welfare, which is who are you and where do you belong, which means where should you access benefits. And I'm going to argue that the real rural urban welfare regime split is an unsaid argument that the poor should not receive their benefits in the city, but in the rural location where they belong. Right? And this is, I think, yesterday's discussion of we are imagined rurally, and you know, in the second Berkeley, in the second conference, Amita Bhaviskar said something very powerful, where she said, in some sense, social movements and land-based movements in rural India have been so powerful at talking about the rootedness of people to land that the urban migrant has been rendered homeless, literally by how powerful that claim was, right? Because, and it was a, I think she was, and she comes from a history of writing about. Um, resource movements across the country, and she was very perplexed by this, and it was, a, it was a provocation, she was challenging herself, but it stuck in my head for some time, and I think this whole question of the ambiguous journey to the city, this question of you are not meant to be here, I think underlies a lot of the way in which the failures of governance and implementation lay out. So what I actually want to suggest is to think of two moments that provoke me to think, write about what I'm gonna speak about today. The first is, to take on geographical targeting, to have this discomfort with the idea that the slum is findable where it's meant to be, right? That the, that the settlement structure of the urban poor is actually relatively stable. And I, I mean, my bias comes from my own work on eviction and resettlement, but also a history of two decades of evictions in Indian cities, where households are multiply evicted in the same lifetime, which means actually, the idea that we can find the poor in a thing called the slum is actually um, empirically untrue in many of our cities because the guarantee that they will remain in the context of rapid eviction and resettlement is actually very uncertain, which again adds. So, you know, my first, my first own work in this area comes from following evicted families from Yamana Pushta to Bhavana and finding that it takes, for people who have held ration cards for 20 years, it takes no less than two, but even up to 10 years to get back on PDS rolls once you've moved. Because once you've been moved inside the city, you can no longer answer the question. You may be able, still be able to answer the question of who you are, but you cannot answer the question of where you live. And without being able to say where you live, you cannot, you cannot claim yourself to be an urban citizen who should receive this welfare. The second interaction was actually a policy consulting we did with, um, as IHS with the committee of experts that was formed to draft a new municipal act for Delhi. Because the Delhi Municipal Corporation was split into three. The Dharmarajan Committee, headed by a very, very reflective um, 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 IS officer called Kitty Dharmarajan, asked us a simple question. He said, how do I know who lives here? So he said, universalization of services from the municipality, but who should get it? I said, but it's universal. He said, but, but who within the uni like who lives in this slum? And it was a real contrast because it was after the acceptance of universalization of welfare that the question of, but who lives in this slum? And that's what I actually want to talk about is this question of thinking about that if we begin from our cities as they stand, then one of the things that makes urban welfare very difficult is that the predominant condition of spatial settlement in our cities is one of illegality of various kinds. Can you claim welfare from a position of spatial illegality? And that's my provocation. And, I'm not, and I don't have an answer to it. But that's what, the other thing I want to think about. And I want to use Professor Sivaramakrishnan's provocation yesterday of the intent of the government. And I want to think about not what do the policy framework stand for now, but what do they tell us about the intent of government? And what could a different intent or a different phrasing of that intention lead to a different policy paradigm? 
having said all of that, I should start <laughs> if I'm going to get anywhere. Um, OK, so I certainly think that we are in a moment. It may not be a moment of opportunity, but it is a moment of emergence, which means something is coming, whether we like it or not. And it will either take us somewhere, or we'll be stuck with its outfall, either of which may happen. There is an idea of inclusive growth in an India that at least partially now lives in its cities. And there are these elements of a frame that Professor Mathur also laid out. Um, livelihoods, property rights, basic services, um, the idea of the Unorganized Workers Social Security Act, so reaching beyond the formal informal divide for the right to education, the right to food, that's, uh, near, that was just, the bill was just passed in, uh, in the last week, uh, the rise in health expenditure, the health insurance scheme of RSPY, and I will say knowns and known unknowns in the idea of the UID and the conditional cash transfers. And I, I really am sort of, I have a very hard time knowing what, what to think about either of these, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, so I'm going to bring back three historical trends using Smitha's work um, from 2010 and before lunch. Um, the, idea of, <laughs> the idea of place, work, and workplace. And, and I use these because I, I do think they capture something very useful. Because it helps me tie in my question, which is how do you consider the impact of spatial illegality within both residence and work? So an illegal space of work as well as an illegal space of residence in the determination and implementation of urban welfare. How does it get in the way? What does it do? What does it not do? And my basic proposition is urban workers are also urban residents. I sound like an 80s urban neo-Marxist reminding everyone that we all live here. We don't just aren't dusted factories. But while informality in employment is talked about and recognized, how it's entangled with spatial legality legality that affects both place and workplace is what I want to think about. Um, so a quick note on terminology to preempt the question, uh, and because I was taught well. Um, the, I'm using these words very particularly. Uh, when I say formal and informal, in one sense I use it to describe the nature of transaction for land. So for example, if you paid through checks and have a stamp paper-like document, that, which is an agreement to sell between a party who had the right to sell it to you, it is a formal transaction of land. You may not be able to register that agreement to sell in a registry, and you would create in Delhi what's known as an unauthorized colony, where a formal transaction still leads to an illegal title which is different from an informal transaction, which is cash and financial, which happens not just in slums, but across the property barrier, but has a very different set of claims in terms of protecting what they have built, when they can pull out the agreement to sell or they cannot pull out the agreement to sell. And I'm going to talk about the difference between that. I also use formal and informal to talk about the nature of use. So are you in violation of the plan zoning laws? Have you built extra floors? Are you running commercial offices where you shouldn't be running them? And the reason I don't use legal illegal here, because very often we actually don't know what the use is, and the zone doesn't exist. So the, the, the haziness of extra legal, informal, legal comes to play here. I stick to legal illegal when I mention, very specifically speak about the legality of title. Quite clearly, will the bank give you a loan? And can you go to the LNDO office and register your property that you just bought? That's my single definition of legal or illegal title. You can do it in a planned colony. You cannot do it in an unauthorized colony. That gives me some sense of division. So the, very quickly, what I'm going to pull up a table that's very familiar to many of you, which is the settlement typologies of Delhi from 2000. It's not as recent now. The recent ways of regularization will have changed these numbers. But to just show you one row at the bottom, that planned colonies in 2000 housed 23.7% of the city's population, right? which means that the remaining 76% settle in some form of informality or illegality, as I have defined. So when we talk about a welfare regime structured in the city, we are talking about structuring welfare within settlements that are dominantly illegally settled. Right? And which means that the claims, now which of these are illegal? Here's a quick question from my definition. JJ clusters are clearly illegal. Right? Very often they occupy public or private land. They have no pretensions to claiming. JJ cluster is what we quickly call a basti. Right? Different from the recognized slum, which is notified under the slum designated area, which then receives some kind of protection. Actually, one interesting thing about Delhi is that most of the notified slums are in the old city. So it's actually a very skewed metric um, because the old city areas were first slum, then World Heritage Area, then they were a slummy heritage area together for a while. <laughs> and, but it basically meant between the two, you could never touch it. That essentially is the argument. The, the JJ resettlement colony is the classic path of settlement to the city for the poor. You get into a JJ cluster, you survive long enough, you get evicted, but then you get resettled into a resettlement colony, and you post facto enter into the plan. Right? The unauthorized colony is the illegal settlement of the rich, where they buy land formally, 
but the transaction was not permitted. It's a rural land sold for urban use, which the, la the farmer did not have the right to sell for that use outside the plan, and therefore the titles cannot be recognized and cannot be registered. You can't get a loan from HDFC Bank, who is my arbiter of all things legal. Right? Um, HDFC Bank gave me a loan for half my house, which is why I particularly feel this. Um, so, you know, so you look at these categories, and what you're seeing is two pathways from legality as, as occupation towards post-factor regularization, from the JJ cluster, the resettlement colony, from the unauthorized colony to the gloriously named regularized unauthorized colony. Right? Now, these are, at some other point, we should talk about the politics of names and categories here, right? Because calling a JJ cluster a cluster and not a colony indicates that a 15,000 household basti is just a cluster of things that is temporary, right? And it's a, it's a very interesting kind of power play. Why a regularized, unauthorized colony is not a planned colony is beyond me. Because at this point, it is now legal. It is on the plan. Its title can be registered. But you have to constantly remind it that it came from illegality. Same thing for a JJ resettlement colony. There's no reason why it should simply not be a colony, right? But these are, I think, parts of the lexicon of planning. I've left up some recent work looking at which types are formal, legal, plan, legitimate. I put this up um, only because I know the PowerPoints will circulate and it's a ready reference. Um, it's part of work that's just um, on its way out. But my point about that dominant condition of illegality for the rich and the poor then hits me to why does this matter? The first reason why it matters is, of course, insecure tenure, which means that when you're looking, if the point of a welfare regime is the prevention of destitution at its very least, if you have a scale of eviction and resettlement, where the threat of eviction alone prevents investment, upgradation, and change. The reality of eviction depletes stocks, and your entire program of access to basic services and assets gets undone because the settlement to which you geographically target no longer exists. And the scale of this, I just want to very quickly show you, this is this work that we're doing here. In the blue, you see existing JJ clusters. In the magenta, you see evicted JJ clusters from 1990 to 2007. These are 217 incidents of eviction. 217 incidents of eviction, and you can see what part of the overall universe of slums that they are claiming. Now, in this context of a dynamic spatial movement of poverty and eviction, how do you structure an urban welfare regime? Right? How do you structure a universal welfare regime? And you don't have to just look at Delhi. This is Bangalore from two months ago in Ejipura, right? a program that, incidentally, was, is an on-site public-private redevelopment where 30% of the land will be used for low-income housing except they'll give low-income housing, and this proves the point that I'm trying to make today, only to original residents who are allotted the plots. How many families are those? 400. How many families lived on the site? 15,000. Right? So the question of paperwork, right? the question is not just a procedural implementation. It's actually about the very structure of the welfare regime itself. In addition to insecure tenure, there are very clear legal restrictions to service delivery. So now these are beginning to fall away. Earlier, if you were an unauthorized colony or a slum, the municipality was simply not supposed to provide you services. Now, even with those restrictions being removed, the real politic is that to get institutions to actually put services into JJ clusters that may not exist five years from now, any rational municipal officer will say, how is this worth my money? Right? So without an establishment of some kind of security of tenure and a guarantee against eviction, to think of the provision of welfare-based services, to me, is a non-starter. Right? The second I want to talk about is the difficulty of existing on paper that I won't go back to because I think it's been made. That the restrictions, as so we're talking about the policy distortions that Professor Mathur raised, one of them actually is as simply as the fact that in a resettlement colony, you cannot rent. You cannot run a commercial enterprise. Right? So you have development control norms that cannot imagine residence or place as workplace. Right? And why does this also matter? Because all welfare regime recipients are original plot-owning owner-occupiers, which means the incentive to rent out means the loss of access to welfare regimes. So there is a fundamental distortion on being who you are and talking about where you belong and where you're supposed to be. I want to quickly get to, um, of course, the, the distinction then uh, between the separation, as Smitha argued, between work, access to a secure place of work, and it's, I, earlier I had written right to a secure place of work, but I changed it after yesterday's discussion, and a secure tenure for residents. And I think that these, holding these two together is very critical. So what do we do? So my suggestion in the change of the intent is to change the question of who you are and where you belong from a proof of residence to a proof of the intent to reside. 
Right? So it's, 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 it's a very prescriptive policy mechanism on which the basis we can think of rules in. And where does it come from? Ritika Khera and Jean Dres have argued, I think very nicely in talking about universal regimes, that we must stop obsessing about mistargeting and free riders and get on with it. And they have a very good argument that says, give the benefit of the doubt to the poor in and that when they claim to be poor, they in fact are so. Because even if they're not poor, they're only going to be slightly less poor than your BPL line. Right? And I think that benefit of doubt is an excellent statement of intent. That if your policy of urban welfare regime's intent is actually an economic and human development of people, then the benefit of doubt is from where you must begin. What does the benefit of doubt look like in the context of spatial illegality? My proposal procedurally is to use the spirit of the benefit of doubt approach to add to a frame of universal entitlements, it won't work without that, a shift from the burden of proving resident to dent reside. How will you convince the last arbiters of policy in this country, which is the Supreme Court of India, uh, in how to do this? Um, my suggestion is to follow a 1963 case called Jagir Kaur and another versus Jaswan Singh, where the court laid down a very interesting definition that said, we would define the word resides thus. A person resides in a place if he, through choice, makes it his abode permanently or even temporarily. And I, the emphasis here is mine, because I think it, this formulation allows you a certain possibility of thinking about how you could procedurally operationalize the intent to reside even temporarily. So the court goes in and says, a person A, living in a village, goes to nearby town B to attend a marriage and to make purchases and stays there in a hotel for a day or two. A person A is a tourist. He goes, from, I love this judgment, I have to say, goes from place to place during his peregrinations, which apparently in 1960s with uh, Cambridge return judges, and stays for a few days in each of the places he peregrinates to. Huh? A same person A is a resident of a village, very important, who is suffering from a chronic disease. Uh, he goes along with his wife to a town for medical treatment. He takes a house and he lives there for about six months. And the court is getting there now to these legally defensible definitions of what does it mean to prove intent to reside. Or A, a permanent resident of a town, goes to a city for higher education, takes a house and lives there alone or with his wife <laughs> to complete his studies. And what the court says is, in the first two cases, A makes only a flying visit or penetration. Um, and he has no intention, and, and I really, what I really like about this is that the focus is on the intention of the migrant. It's in the intention of the circulation, last slide, to live either permanently or temporarily in the places he visits. It cannot, therefore, be said that he resides in the places he visits. However, in the last two illustrations, though A has a permanent house elsewhere, which answers some of the concerns that Carol was raising about this nature of a migrant who's a taxi driver in Bombay but has a house, Though A is a permanent, he has a clear intention, or because all things sound more legal in Latin, animus menendi, <laughs> to make the places where he has gone for medical relief in one and studies in the other, his temporary abode of residence. In the last two cases, it can be said that though he is not a domicile of those places, he resides in those places. And what we went back to the committee of experts um, headed by Mr. Dharmarajan, we said, use this as your defense, put intent to reside, and take off the burden of proof. And basically, because the, the idea to prove intent to reside and with a notion of about six months allows both cyclical migration and greatly increases your ability to widen your net. The key part is it depends on you wanting to widen your net as opposed to designing your program to throw people out of the net, which is why the intent of the program to me is as important as the structure of it. My last slide is going to be similar to Shana's last slide, which is what then... Because one, I'm going to preempt the question. One obvious question is, should the UID not give you this possibility? It is undeniable to me that some of the concerns of spatial or residential illegality may resolve themselves through the UID if it succeeds in moving the burden of proof of address to proof of identity. And under universalization, you should be able to say who you are is enough. Right? That's basically the basic principle. But if the entitlement regimes in their procedures still require some sense of proof or of notion of residence, which is what's coming out of both our papers, then UID alone will remain insufficient to do this. It is also true that the UID has one of the most open and expansive list of documents that it accepts in order to give you a card. 
but ethnographic evidence of its practice counters that expansive paper trail completely saying, actually, UID camps say, where's your ration card? Where is your voter ID? And in practice, and this goes back again to the intent, in practice, that is, I'm being generous when I say it's mixed in its findings. And additionally, of course, the concerns about the nature of welfare transfers between cash and substitution I have not touched. Concerns about the feasibility of the UID at all and its intergenerational timeline so it may come um, also remain. Thank you.